We all know how the story of Nelson ended, but do you know how it began? Well, today, I'm going to be relaying the story of Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson. I'm in Burnham Thorpe at the birthplace and childhood home of Nelson. He was born here on the 29th of September, 1758. No, he wasn't birthed in a barn, all right? The original family home, i.e. the old rectory, was actually demolished in 1808, but would have stood just 20 yards back from this wall. Horatio's parents were Edmund Nelson and Catherine Suckling, the former of which was rector at this very church here in Burnham Thorpe. We're now here at Burnham Over Estate, and this is where a young Horatio Nelson, when he was a wee boy, learnt to sail here. This is where he learnt his craft of sailing, here. It doesn't look like there's a lot of water now, and of course there isn't, but once the tide's in, cracking place to sail. Horatio lived a humble childhood, with nothing really to write home about until the age of 12, when, thanks to his uncle, Captain Morris Suckling. He joined the Royal Navy as midshipman. Little did that country boy with his thick Norfolk accent know that he would one day become Britain's best known admiral. Thanks to Unky Morris, he enjoyed a fruitful 
first few years of service, including a deployment in the East Indies, where he fell seriously ill with malaria in 1775. Still, he passed his lieutenant exams just two years later, at the age of 18. That's not all bad, really. Time progresses, and so too does Horatio, who reaches the rank of commander around about his 20th birthday. The 12-gun, 90-men strong brig, HMS Badger, was the first vessel which he had full independent control of. In 1787, Nelson married a delightful young widow named Frances Fanny Nisbet. Fanny was the daughter of a wealthy plantation owner in the West Indies, and she, along with Horatio, lived together in the old rectory. Six years of inactivity and half pay from the Admiralty followed, supposedly driving Nelson stir-crazy due to his lust for action and desire to get back out on the open water. Thanks to the Revolutionary War with France, Nelson was sent back out to sea in 1793 as the commander of a 64-gun battleship, HMS Agamemnon. In 1794, Hood gave him command of naval forces ashore during the capture of Corsica. Sadly though, he got hit in the face by gravel thrown up by a French cannonball, which landed a bit too close for comfort. Thereafter, he was only able to distinguish light from dark out of his right eye. Nelson was well known for being visible alongside his men, and for treating his crew kindly, something which was otherwise unheard of back in the 17th century. This, though, earned him total and utter respect, which is a big part of why he was so successful. Speaking of success, in February of 1797, Nelson executed a meticulous and complex plan devised by a bloke called John Jervis, amongst others, which resulted in the mortally wounded Admiral of the San Jose, or San Joseph as it became known post-capture, handing over his sword to Nelson directly. However, even more impressively was the way in which Nelson boarded said ship via the Saint Nicolas, which had become entangled with her fellow Spanish ship. In fact, Nelson just casually brought his ship, HMS Captain, alongside the San Nicolas, partaking in a wee sword fight with that crew before then engaging with the crew on board the San Jose. This victory, the first of many, might I add, saw Nelson get the affection and recognition and fame, in fact, which he had craved for so long. However, this enjoyment was short-lived, as later on in 1797, the July of, to be precise, Nelson and Jervis were back at it, this time attacking Tenerife. Sadly, the British were defeated in a humiliating show. Most shocking of all, though, was the injury Nelson ascertained, thanks to a musket ball which shattered his upper right arm. The truth of the matter is, he would have died that day if it wasn't for the quick actions of son of son that John Geyser. If it wasn't for him stemming the blood flow and taking Horatio back to the flagship, where amputation was sadly the only solution for the poor sailor. Still, at least Jervis took pity on him and allowed him to go rest at home in Norfolk. A left-handed admiral will never again be considered useful, wrote a now heavily depressed Nelson. June 1798 now, and the Nile campaign is officially underway, seeing a 39-year-old Admiral Nelson, along with the rest of Lord St Vincent's 14-strong fleet, chased down a significant French fleet in Egypt, finding them anchored in Abakir Bay. Now, the way in which the ships were moored should have been a strong position. However, the French hadn't done it properly. They'd actually left enough room to the landward side for the British to squeeze on in. Coupled with forces out to the seaward side, 
including Nelson in the flagship HMS Vanguard, the Brits had the advantage right from the outset. Most notably, at around 10pm, the French flagship Lorient exploded when the magazines ignited. The noise was supposedly heard up to 10 miles away and, well, recent archaeology has found that debris far away from the location of the main wreck, which supports this account. Overall, the battle was a huge global success and inevitably celebration. After Horatio Nelson's victory with the Battle of the Nile, this 17th century pub here in Burnham Thorpe, which was previously known as The Plough, was renamed the Lord Nelson in his honour. Right, it's time for pine. Recently revamped, this characterful country pub still resembles much of the original building. Fun fact for you, we actually had a meal it, while we were there, in the very room where, just before Nelson's departure for the Battle of the Nile, he had thrown a party. Before coming home though, Nelson first stopped off in Naples, where he spent some time recovering from a nasty head wound, which had resulted in blood and flesh all just like streaming down over his good eye during some intense fight. Ugh. Horrible stuff. Um, anyway, now, while it wasn't a life-threatening injury as such, he was definitely shaken and stirred, and pretty tired too. Henceforth, he needed someone to nurse him back to health. And that's where Emma Hamilton came in. British envoy Sir William Hamilton and his wife, Emily, invited the battle-scarred hero, Horatio, to stay with them. After a while, though, Nelson's relationship with the latter turned somewhat intimate. Now, I'm not going to lie, it wasn't particularly surprising that an international celebrity, and the nurse for whom, became very rather close. Doing next to nothing to hide it, though, was very controversial. And the fact that William didn't even mind either, leaving a miniature of his wife to Nelson in his will made the whole situation surreal. I mean, at one of Sir Hamilton's dinner gatherings, Nelson got out his sword and started swinging it all over the place, as you do, right? And then Emma just starts sighing and ooing all dreamily. Yet no one even thought to mention the fact that this defied all social norms and morals of the time. And I was talking about the stabby stabby sort of sword just then. Alright, don't get any wrong ideas. This wasn't the only scandal that surrounded Nelson and his time in Italy. Oh no! You see, his complicity in the brutal execution of Neapolitan revolutionaries is still debated to this day. Eventually, Nelson did have to get back to Britain but not before embarking on an overland journey through Europe with the Hamiltons. Right from the moment he landed here in Great Yarmouth, Nelson was greeted with unconditional love and support from the nation. In fact, he even, he even gave a speech from the top window of this now ex-pub, saying, I am myself a Norfolk man, and I am glory in being so. Likewise, mate. However, he did have bigger fish to fry here in Norfolk. And no, I'm not referring to the beer bad fish and chips which he almost certainly would have indulged in down the pub. No, I'm, I'm talking about his wife, Fanny Nelson. Yeah, remember her? Well, she was justifiably exceptionally upset by the revelation surrounding Emily, which actually reached her via rumour. Nevertheless though, she did give her beloved Horatio a few more months before inevitably he had to choose between his devoted wife or his pregnant lover. Wait, pregnant lover? Yes, that's right. Nelson had impregnated Emma Hamilton. Bollocks. With a baby imminent, Nelson, well Nelson chose Emma Hamilton of course, 
However, this didn't go smoothly. Of course not. As we now know, thanks to a series of moving letters written to a Mr. Davidson, whereby Francis conveys serious bewilderment and distress in relation to the whole event. Still, at least Horatio was humble enough to fix up a proper allowance to enable her to remain quiet. And he wished, for her sake, that people would never mention his name to her. However, realistically, all Francis wanted was her Horatio. And so the letter which quotes those things I've just said wouldn't have been really any comfort to her now, would it? Early 1801, and a now desperately unhappy Nelson is summoned back to sea. Horatia, Emily and Horatio's daughter, is born, and the couple are exchanging letters almost daily. Unfortunately, though, because a um, <coughs> bastard baby would have been the end of the hero back in those days, he had to devise a plan. Basically, basically, there was this fictional sailor called Thompson, the wife of whom was Preggers, who was being looked after by the Hamiltons. This, therefore, allowed Nelson to keep on riding home and, you know, sharing tender messages of love to the mother and infant. It is quite a common assumption that the Age of Sail, as it were, merely featured the British fighting French and Spanish fleets. However, this is far from true, as on the 2nd of April 1801, the Battle of Copenhagen took place. In the months leading up to the battle, Baltic states put an embargo on British trading ships. In response, Nelson, serving second in command to Admiral Sir Parker, was sent out of Great Yarmouth to sort things out. In fact, they would have boarded their fleet of ships via a jetty, which is now no longer here. It was demolished about a decade ago now. It wasn't all smooth sailing for the British, far from it in fact. The shoals, land forts, floating batteries and hulks all stood in the way of the British. In fact, the former of which alone was responsible for wiping out a quarter of the British attacking force. Couple that with over-prepared Danes, and it's no wonder that Parker signalled for Nelson and that lot to get the hell out of there. Or did he? Conveniently, Nelson didn't see the message, supposedly putting a telescope up to his bad eye and unknowingly creating the phrase of turning a blind eye in the process. Anyway, back to the battle, and Nelson ploughed on regardless. Good job he did, too as he managed to weaken and collapse the centre of the Danish line. At which point, Nelson sent a message proposing a truce. This was accepted and made way for the very man himself to negotiate a deal with Denmark. Long story short, Nelson had used administrative and diplomatic skills alongside his tactical fighting to secure a vital and pivotal win. Upon his return, Nelson was in immediately placed as commander-in-chief of a large fleet designed to calm any sort of invasion scare and to protect the Thames estuary. During this time, he did try to attack some French forces at one point on the, uh, on the 15th of August 1801, but Admiral Treville was experienced and had studied Nelson, so I was ready for him and his antics. In October of that year, peace finally seemed possible, and so Nelson was at last released to go live ashore. And he did so with Lady Hamilton, who had found an estate in Merton, sorry, it's, it's now actually part of South London, but, but for some reason the property had a bad surveyor's report, and yet they still decided to go ahead and purchase it. With the help of that Davidson bloke that I mentioned earlier, by the way. May 1803, and the French were war hungry again. This meant Nelson received his most prestigious appointment yet. The command of the Mediterranean fleet. Everything seemed to be going well for the man, with his letters to Emma appearing more mundane than ever before. 
He wrote about gossip, projects at Merton, and even plans for Horatia's future. In addition, across the two years he spent at sea with the Mediterranean fleet, he managed to keep his men happy and healthy, and his ships, well, ship shape, without a single one needed to go back to a dockyard. 19th of August 1805, and Nelson arrived back in Portsmouth for a short break. During said break, though, everyone wanted advice and to cheer him on. From every average Tom, Dick and Harry to the Prime Minister William Pitt. He was the man of the moment, himself remarking, I am now set up for a conjurer. Horatio took this opportunity to engage in a private communion ceremony with Emma in the parish church. They were as good as married and spent a whole 25 days together before Nelson was quickly recalled to sea. He rushed back down to Portsmouth where he boarded the HMS Victory and headed off to Cadiz. The night of his 47th birthday, and Nelson hosted a dinner party in the Victory where he ran through the plans to defeat the combined French and Spanish forces. The Nelson Touch, as he called it, involved splitting up the enemy fleet into different divisions which would inflict confusion and allow the British to concentrate and maximise their firepower onto smaller sections. 21st of October 1805, and it was time to shine. Vice Admiral Collingwood took the rear portion of the fleet, whilst Nelson and co stormed straight through the centre, leaving the front third to sail on helplessly and be picked off later. This was a somewhat risky move, as while coming in from the side, French and Spanish ships could fire away at the Brits, but they couldn't retaliate as their guns were all positioned down the sides. During the first stage of battle, HMS Victory got entangled with the Redemptable, and it was from the latter's rigging where a sniper shot Horatio Nelson at about 1.15pm. Fatally wounded, he was carried down the waterline to Victory's cockpit. Here he lay for hours in excruciating pain. Meanwhile, the battle raged on, with British soldiers' morale at an all-time low, but their determination at an all-time high. Eventually, they did go on to win, but with huge costs, with 5,000 men lost across both sides. One of which, of course, being the man, the myth and the legend, Lord Horatio Nelson, who was able to hold on just long enough find out that he was victorious. His last words were reportedly, thank God I have done my duty. So, there you have it. That was the story of Nelson. Not all of it. What happened after he died? Uh, Alright then, so, his body was placed into a cask full of brandy on board the HMS Victory, which then went to Gibraltar, although it took Quite a while because there was a storm. Yeah, um, and in actual fact, because of that storm, right? Only four of the nineteen prize ships captured by the British during the Battle of Trafalgar actually made it into port. On the twenty eighth of October, they did finally make it into Gibraltar, and while well, they switched out the brandy for wine, as it's better as preservation, and all that was crucial. HMS Victory took an entire week's worth of TLC in repair before she was even seaworthy. 4th of December 1805 and Nelson's body finally reached England. Over the preceding weeks it was kept in various different coffins including one made from the mainmast of L'Orient. From the 4th till the 7th of January 1806 Nelson's body lay in state at Greenwich Hospital's Painted Hall. It's estimated that nearly 100,000 people came and paid their respects during this three-day period. Finally then, Nelson was transported up the River Thames to the Admiralty in Whitehall, using the King's Barge, no less, before, before then a funeral procession to St Paul's Cathedral the following day. It was here that a five-hour service took place, interrupted by serving sailors ripping bits off of Victory's battle ensign. 
the one that was draped over Nelson's coffin. Yeah. Interestingly enough, though, neither Francis Nisbet, whose, whose health had deteriorated somewhat, nor Lady Hamilton were actually allowed to attend. In fact, the latter was very heavily neglected by the state, despite Nelson's will and testimony. Which some say Emma was actually edited out of after Trafalgar. She died of dysentery, alone and penniless in France. And as for Fanny, well she too spent many of her final years in the country, which Nelson had spent so much of his life fighting. Ironic that, eh? Oh, I suppose I ought to, I suppose I ought to talk about HMS Victory as well, really. Um, so, it's all clear what precisely happened after she was brought back to Britain and given a major refit in 1805, but I believe that she did have a few more years of active service before then getting anchored out in Portsmouth Harbour for an entire century, right? Um, during which time she played host to some prisoners and she also had her wooden mast switched out for some wrought iron ones fresh from HMS Shah. Finally, she was placed into the famous Dry Dock 2 in 1922, where she has remained to this day as the world's oldest naval vessel, still commissioned 258 years after she was first launched. And on that note, thank you all so, so much for watching. I've been Al. Goodbye.